This is most unfortunate. We cannot tolerate any more all this system. And you know the people are behind me. Everything is collapsed. There is no administration. The people are obeying my order, not their order. Legally, I am the authority because people have voted to me. Now they are using their force. It is up to them now to decide what to do. But I can tell you one thing. Nobody should play with the fire. Nobody should try to suppress the 70 million people. When they are determined to achieve something, nobody can suppress them. Today, tomorrow, or day after tomorrow. They must win. Victory is ours. Sheikh Mujibur Rahman is the man at the center of the crisis now threatening to split Pakistan apart. In West Pakistan, he is disliked, mistrusted, even hated. But here among the Bengalis of East Pakistan, he is idolized. Sheikh Mujibur, known to his devoted followers as Mujib, is now the undisputed political leader of East Pakistan. In the general elections last December, the Sheikh Sawami League swept the board, capturing all but two of East Pakistan's seats in the Constituent Assembly and thus gaining an overall national majority. It seemed like the golden opportunity the East had been waiting for, a chance to redress some of its grievances and demand greater independence from the West. But politicians in West Pakistan were alarmed at the thought of having Sheikh Mujibur as the next Prime Minister and the leader of the victorious party in the West, Mr. Bhutto, refused to attend the new assembly unless the Sheikh modified some of his demands. The crisis came in Pakistan's 24th year as a separate nation, 24 years in which its two halves have struggled to maintain a common identity in spite of the thousand miles of Indian territory which separate them. For many people in the Eastern Wing, that struggle no longer seems worthwhile. Easterners have long felt they've had a raw deal from the central government in Royal Pindi. They complain of economic neglect with unfair allocation of foreign aid and investment funds, and they say that until now they've had nothing like the political influence they deserve as the nation's most populous province. They were looking forward eagerly to dominating the new assembly. And when President Yahya Khan finally decided to postpone its first meeting, they came out onto the streets as an angry mob, burning the Pakistani flag and calling for the creation of a free Bengal. President Yahya sent in troops to reinforce the strong garrison already stationed in the east. Unlike the Pathans and Punjabis of the West, the Bengalis have no great military tradition, and they form only 10% of the armed forces. The first spasm of rioting caused many casualties. Central government officials put the number of dead at 172, but the East Pakistanis claimed at least 500 had died. Sheikh Mujibur's response was to declare a five-day hartal, or general strike, followed by an organized campaign of non-cooperation with the central authorities. Trade between the two halves of the country virtually ceased, and central government control over the eastern wing came to an end. Bengalis demonstrated in no uncertain manner that their allegiance now belonged to Mujib. It's this support of the masses which has helped to make Sheikh Mujibur the most important politician was in East right. Pakistan today. Uh, why do you How enjoy such tremendous support, do you think? Uh, you know that I love my people and my people loves me. I'm ready to sacrifice everything for them. And naturally they will also sacrifice everything for what I say. And I am fighting for a principle, for a cause, and for the emancipation and freedom of my people. And, and definitely, the people who have been oppressed for long 23 years, naturally the people now stand by me and I must stand by them. I'm not anxious for anything, I'm anxious for the emancipation of my people. 
politically, economically and all matters. Now you're using this word emancipation, liberation, a freedom from a long exploitation by the other wing of Pakistan. Some of your supporters prefer the word independence. Now you didn't use that yesterday. It is automatically comes. I have also used it something like this. It automatically comes if these people behave like a colonial power and if the armed forces of the country use like a occupation army and kill the innocent armed people, how can ex what we can expect from the people then? You had the opportunities are determined to continue along the path of democracy uh, until the last moment. You're going to make the other people... You know, I am believing the democratic process. If anybody use our force, if people counteract by force, then their responsibility. That's why I am quite concerned. As a democratic man, I follow the democratic movement. And I have started for Shatagraho and non-cooperation movement against them. And I am sure my people will not pay tax. I am sure the people will not join in the government. I am sure the people are absolutely behind me and my party. Well, won't that make President Yahya Khan take military action against you? It is up to him. I don't care. I am for a cause. I'm ready to sacrifice everything for my people. Do you think your people are able to withstand an attack by the military government? Do you know that nobody can suffer the 70 million people? That when the 70 million people determine to achieve something, nobody can suppress it. It might be they can suppress for a few years, a few days, but a few months, but in the long run, the peoples and the peoples must win. No, nowhere in the world the struggle has failed. Nowhere. It might be some more bloodshed, but nothing can happen like this. Sheikh Mujib. Sheikh Mujibur's optimism is not shared by all observers of the Pakistani scene. One factor which makes a Bengali victory less than inevitable is the chronic weakness of East Pakistan's economy. It wasn't long before the Sheikh's policy of non-cooperation, applied so eagerly by his followers, began to create as many difficulties for the rebels as it did for the central government. To feed a population that grows by 6,000 every day, East Pakistan has to import 3 million tons of food a year. With the ports closed, the province was soon threatened with a serious food shortage, which was immediately reflected in rising prices. Rice, which was always much dearer than in the West, increased by 25%. Fish, which with rice forms the Bengali's staple diet, almost doubled in price. How has this policy of Sheikh Mujib's of non-cooperation affected you? Well, it's affected us in the company here, in, insofar as that we're gradually grinding to a halt. We're working as best we can in the office, but our factories up country, uh, away from Dhaka, are not receiving the money they should, they're not being able to buy jute, and although we can send our stuff down to the ports for export, which is our main business here, once the goods get to the port, they are stuck there since no exports are taking place because the customs is closed. Uh, how, how much business is involved? Present uh, fortnight's passed when we've done nothing, that means there's half a million pounds stuck, half a million pounds worth of goods which should have been exported and Pakistan should have been paid for it, and that has not come in. Pretty serious as far as Pakistan's foreign currency is concerned. Since we're such a small unit here, I think it's very serious. It's a, when you remember that Pakistan uses about 23% of all the foreign exchange earnings just simply to pay interest on foreign aid loans. It's pretty serious when you lose a fortnight's income. How about manufacturing industry? The, manufact the fa factories and all the various industries are, are working again. They have been working since Tuesday. But they, they, they grind a halt too because where can they send their goods? They, the ones who deal locally, who only sell internally, will be all right. But the ones who export, and those are the ones that really count as far as the economy of the country is concerned, will again grind to halt in the same way as we, we're doing. What, what about the difficulties over banking? How is that going to affect things? Banking is a big problem. There seems to be some uncertainty as to what the exact directives are. I find that, um, I get the impression rather, I should say, that it's rather difficult to get money. Money is running short. Some of the banks would like to give you money but can't. And when we come to pay wages at the end of the month and uh, give money up country to buy jute and to buy jute goods, 
and there isn't any money, this is going to be a very serious problem. You mean that, uh, the, that the workers could get pretty angry with the businesses that employ them? The workers could get extremely angry with the workers, with the employers, because they, they don't reason why. All they know is they don't get their money, and they're going to do something about it. How about your own people? We've already had a little bit of trouble in the office in that our staff have applied for all their problem fund to be withdrawn. They've applied for three months' salary in advance, and they've also asked for a bank guarantee that we'll pay their salary up to the end of the year. Well, this, of course, I can't do, and I replied to them, telling them that this showed they didn't have the faith, which I certainly had, in the elected party. I haven't had any reaction to that yet. Do you have any faith in an independent East Pakistan? Faith is perhaps not the word I would use, but I think an independent Pakistan is quite a viable proposition. After all, when Pakistan started in 1947, the whole country had less than East Pakistan has now in the way of industries and, and know-how. So although there will be difficulties, there's no doubt about that. I it, think it would depend very much on foreign aid, though, It would it? depend entirely on foreign aid, just as the United Pakistan depends on foreign aid. Nothing new about that. But East Pakistan would have to get rec recognition pretty quickly. I should imagine, not being a politician, that would be a normal thing to do. If a new country is um, created, that it would be recognized by the great powers. What do you think the odds are that it will happen? I wouldn't like to hazard a guess because I think both sides are trying very hard for compromise. And that would be the best solution? And that would be the best solution because it means that, at the very worst, there'd be two countries which are still friendly. But if uh, things get uh, bad here and the, the separation is done in an unfriendly way, then not only would they be separated, but they would be unfriendly, which is a thing we all want to avoid. As the foreigners left, Bengalis flocked to mass rallies where the dominant cry was for independence, not negotiations. Whatever the mood of their leaders, the crowds gave no impression that they'd be satisfied with a compromise. As the independence fever swept through the country, even Molana Bashani, an old political rival of Sheikh Mujibur, offered his support. Bashani said that if the president does not hand over power to the elected representatives of the people, meaning Sheikh Mujibur's Awami League, he and the Sheikh will lead a massive campaign of liberation. <laughs> Bashani's pledge of support came with a warning to the Sheikh not to compromise with the President. It's better to be a hero, he said, than a Prime Minister. Meanwhile, two weeks of the Sheikh's non-cooperation policy had begun. <laughs> Vigilante groups, mainly Bengali students, set up their own roadblocks and searched cars and their passengers. Any driver unable to speak fluent Bengali was immediately... <laughs> Two men broke away from their questioners and began running. One produced a gun and fired at the rickshaw driver. He was chased, knocked down and stoned to death by a crowd of more than a thousand people. Within minutes, troops were on the streets dispersing the crowds. Quickly and efficiently, they set up positions at strategic points. 
Even so, the incident was a gruesome reminder of just how near Dakar is to boiling over into fierce intercommunal fighting. To prevent the situation getting any worse, President Yahya Khan flew into Dhaka for talks with Sheikh Mujibur. Despite his waves, he received few cheers when his heavily armed convoy sped into the city centre. Sheikh Mujibur emerged from his first meeting with the President in a very non-committal mood and refused to be drawn by the barrage of questions fired at him from the press. Kindly don't ask me any other questions. I have already answered. My discussion is going on about the political situation of this country. And discussion will continue because it is not a very matter of uh, one or two minutes. You require sufficient time to discuss. And tomorrow, 10 o'clock, again, I am meeting the president and discussing. Will some, of you, will some of your people be with If the sheikh was thinking of a compromise, he certainly didn't tell his supporters, whose ringing nationalistic slogans followed his car through the streets of Dhaka. But the question now is, has Mujib overplayed his hand? Many of his more fervent supporters expect him to hold out for independence, and he will need all his political skill to accept a compromise solution and still retain his massive political following. Much will depend uh, on whether President Yahya So it's not a question of my acceding to any point or points of Sheikh Mujib. Is that answered? You have said already that East Pakistan should have maximum autonomy. Yes. Just what did you mean by this? Well, you see, our country is... Uh, perhaps a unique country in the world, country divided into two parts, a thousand miles apart, <clears throat> particularly with a hostile country in between. Even if the country in between is not hostile, the fact remains that geographically we are a thousand miles apart. Therefore, although our future constitution would be a, a federation of provinces, which is a province of East Pakistan and four provinces in West Pakistan. The four provinces of West Pakistan being geographically uh, next to each other, East Pakistan is thousand miles apart. So it cannot be uh, uh, treated at par with the, the other federating mm -hmm. provinces. A special treatment will have to be evolved for them due to geographical distance, other reasons, and of course they are the majority province. They must have uh, means and methods whereby uh, in the overall policies of Pakistan, they must have full powers of making decisions for themselves, both in the economic field, in the, in the administrative field, in the legislative field, uh, they must have, once their resources are allocated to them according to their needs, they must have complete control of their own affairs for the simple reason that they are so many miles away from the rest of the country. So their autonomy will have to be, although on paper all the provinces will be uh, equal, but in actual practice, East Pakistan will have to have much more autonomy than perhaps the other provinces because they are being close to each other, their infrastructure is the same, they can't split to have separate railways, separate uh, uh, other organizations like uh, power and development and things like that. Uh, so that is, I can't exactly define it, it entirely depends on what the National Assembly decides to give them. But as far as I'm concerned, I feel that I uh, will not come in the way of the maximum possible autonomy to East Pakistan uh, as long as it doesn't amount to a separate Pakistan. That is uh, what I meant. A solution to the crisis will clearly depend on the degree of autonomy President Yahya is able to offer the Bengalis. It seems doubtful that he'll be able to meet Sheikh Mujibur's demands for control over everything except foreign affairs and defense. Since the Sheikh is meanwhile being urged to increase his demands to full independence, it's difficult to see what sort of compromise could satisfy both sides. And although both sides are clearly anxious to avoid the horrors of a civil war, 
it would be dangerous to underestimate the Easterners' real desire for a new and better deal. Any doubts they may have had on this issue were finally dispelled last year by what they saw as West Pakistan's negligence and lack of real concern after the catastrophic flooding in the Ganges Delta. Many Easterners are now convinced that the events of the last few months have finally revealed the truth, which is that the two halves of the country simply don't have enough in common to stay together. Whatever the eventual solution, Pakistan, united or divided, can never be the same again. <laughs>